My name is Scott Lee, and I'm alcoholic. <coughs> and uh, we're here to, in this last session, we're going to talk a little bit about Step 12. And we're going to include some of the little blurbs and stories and lessons that uh, just kind of didn't fit anywhere else. And this is some of my favorite stuff. Uh, this is a gift from my, from my mentor, a fellow named Cliff. Some of you have probably heard from the West Coast. He says, the 12 traditions are a set of principles that are designed to protect Alcoholics Anonymous from my very best motives. <laughs> you think about that. That is exactly what that is. That's what a principle does. That it protects me from a motive. Um, page 96. I don't find the word sponsor or sponsorship in the basic text, and I don't find it in the early Roman numerals. It's all over the stories and all the rest of the literature. But it was not one of the original words that was used in the fellowship and yet here we have the description of it crystal clear in two sentences middle paragraph on page 96 suppose you're now making your second visit to a man on the first visit you told your you talked about your drinking he talked about his you laughed you cried you left in the book says he has read this volume and says he's prepared to go through with the 12 steps of the program of recovery so for me that's someone who's sponsorable He's read the book or he's tried to. Have you ever had the experience of trying to read something and your eyes are moving across the page while your mind moves across the universe? (laughs) I can tell you how to stop that. Read out loud. And you will trap your mind in the moment. The retention for me is so much higher. Okay, so he's read the book. Says he's prepared. Watch my hand if you would. He's prepared to go through with the 12 steps. (laughs) All right, we'll settle for that. We don't get a lot of eager ones. I'll go through with the 12. All right. and of the 12 steps of the program recovery. So there's the definition of the program again. It's the 12 steps. So for me, someone who's responsible has made an attempt to read some or all of this book. He understands the 12 steps are the program, and he's going to have to go through them. And then it defines sponsorship or describes the sponsor in the next sentence. It says, having had the experience yourself, you can give him much practical advice. What experience? The experience of going through the 12 steps. What advice? Advice on how to go through the 12 steps. So there's sponsorship in two sentences. That's how I understand it. So when I, I thought uh, initially when I started sponsoring, I thought my first responsibility was to take these guys through the steps, and I think that's second. I think my first responsibility is to love them. I'm told that God is love, and when I give love, I give God. It's the highest gift. And I received the gift that I love all of the men that I sponsor. What a phenomenal place that is to be in. And from the position of love, I can be a, so much better a coach. Be, and, that, and that's really what that is, is to coach someone through doing the 12 steps. And I'm a player coach. I'm still in the game myself. I think it's important. My, uh, my fifth sponsor died. I, I had, his picture sits before me as I talk. And uh, he was terminal. He went home to die. They had the meeting in the hospital. We can make him comfortable. It's a ball game. He goes home to die. I'm sober 11 years, and it doesn't occur to me I should be looking for a sponsor. I can't imagine the world without Don Roy in it. I, I, I can't get that vision. He dies. Two weeks later, I'm as crazy as an outhouse rat. I don't have a sponsor, and I've only got 11 years. Boy, is that ever not enough to be unsponsored, I can tell you that. And uh, so I start looking for a sponsor, and I don't know what I'm looking for. And I prayed about it, and this is a gift that I got is what I did was I inventoried the five men that had sponsored me at that point. They were all very different as individuals, and yet they had common characteristics. So I asked myself, what are the common characteristics? I have been the victim of great sponsorship since, (laughs) that's the best way I know how to say it, (laughs) since my earliest recovery, since I had about four months. Um, And I inventoried these guys. I said, what are their common characteristics? And this is what they were. They were all sober men. Uh, I don't sponsor women. I don't have women sponsor me. I know people that works very well for. Uh, I have the privilege of sponsoring a man that lives in Kiev in the Ukraine. And when he got there a year and a half ago, as best we can tell, he was the only person in the country of 54 million who'd done the 12 steps out of the big book. He needed to sponsor some women, and he does very effectively. I haven't seen an unattractive woman since the summer. I turned 12 years old. And I don't, do not need to get, uh, so for me it doesn't work, all right? And so I'm not, but I'm not putting it down. Did you, I hope you heard me. I'm not putting it down. It's just how it is for me. So it's a sober man who has done the 12 steps. At my home group, they say you can't anymore give away something you ain't got, and you can come back from somewhere you ain't been. So it's got to be someone who's done the 12 steps. If that's the primary job of the sponsor is to first make sure my steps are in place, and second, to plug the holes as, they, as it begins to leak. 
Uh, it's got to be a sober man who's done the steps, who has a sponsor himself. We hope that means that he's surrendered. We know for sure it means that when I can bring him the question he can't answer, we have a plan. It's got to be someone who will tell me the truth I do not want to hear. I got a phone call nine years ago from a guy I used to drink with, and he said, I'm in treatment, and I'm serious, and would you sponsor me? And I said, I'll be happy to, and we're not friends starting right now. Because I'm going to make suggestions, and you're going to take them as orders, or this isn't going to work. He's sober nine years. And it's not because I'm a genius. It's because what's in this book works first time every time, and this is all I know how to do. I'm a one-trick pony. Oh, it's a fabulous trick, but I just got the one. I just got the one. <laughs> So it's got to be someone who will tell me the truth I don't want to hear. It's got to be someone who's active in service. My sponsor said, he said it wasn't possible to have a gratitude meeting. He said it couldn't be done. Because he said the only thing gratitude and attitude have in common is that they rhyme. The gratitude isn't how I feel about it. It's what I do about it. Gratitude is taking a meeting into a jail, a prison, a treatment center, an insane asylum, answering the phones at central office, showing up at your home group early and setting the chairs up, making the coffee. Capturing the newcomers through, coming through the door and giving them a sponsor whether they want one or not. He said it's, that gratitude is going out of your way so that somebody else might get this thing. Our friend Mary Jane says that 12-step that work only counts if it's inconvenient. Only counts if it's inconvenient. And he also said that anonymity keeps me from telling you when I do something good. So it's not possible to have a gratitude meeting according to my sponsor. Anyway, kind of interesting interesting perspective on that so it's got to be someone who is going out of his way that somebody else might get this thing because the winners are all doing something to give it back and the sixth characteristic uh, i'm going to play with you page 132 you'll recognize this and i'm going to show off i apologize the dead center of the page that would be 17 lines from the top and bottom and two words in from both margins where i think it says We absolutely insist on enjoying life. I have got to have a sponsor that laughs a lot. I mean, why did you drink all that? Why were you smoking that stuff? Was it to have a good time? Would you still like to have a good time? Why don't you get a sponsor who's having a good time? I see people get sourpuss sponsors. I can't figure that out to save me. That makes no sense to me whatsoever. And my experience is that people who do this work lay their burdens down, and they laugh a lot. Not that they don't cry, but they laugh a lot. So for me, a sponsor is a sober man who's done the steps, who has a sponsor who tell me the truth I do not want to hear, who's active in service, who laughs a lot. And there stood Ice Cream Steve, and I said, Steve, would you sponsor me? And he said, no. And uh, he said, no, I'll pray about it. Call me tomorrow. I'll call him the next day. And he said, I'll sponsor you. I said, Steve, give me my marching orders. And he said, okay. And I said, don't give me 150, hoping I'll do 100. Give me 150, I'll do 200. I'm surrendered. That's all I know how to do. That's all I know how to do. And he said, I want you in so many A meetings a week. I want you in so many treatment centers a month. I want you in so many jails and prisons a month. I want, and, he, and I want you to follow the directions on 86 and 87, how to open close your day. He started laying stuff out. And one of the things he gave me was the exact opposite of what Don had me doing. I didn't even tell him. I just started doing it the other way. So I'm not here to argue with my sponsor. Just started doing it. I spoke at a conference in Mississippi a year later. And I mentioned that in my talk, and he eventually got a hold of the tape and heard that, and he called me. And he said, I got you doing something exactly opposite what Don Roy had you done. I said, that's right. And he didn't ask me what it was, and I didn't tell him, and I'm not going to tell you. (laughs) Because that's not the point. The point is that my sponsor is final authority in my program of recovery. Final authority. He says it, I do it. It's that simple. And when I do that, what I do is I take my disease, which still resides up here, Still wants to kill me. My disease still has voice. It no longer has vote. He didn't ask me to feel like going to those meetings. He asked me to go. So I take the feel like out of it. It's been important for me. Um, Nine years ago, I picked up two guys within 60 days of each other that were on medications for uh, depression. I believe that there are people who need to be on those, but I also believe it's being grossly overprescribed for us. Now, let's see. Now, you're, you're drinking a quart of scotch a day. You're smoking 12 joints, and you're depressed. Well, clearly, you need to be on meds. And, and, and unfortunately, they don't know about the scotch and the, and, the, and the, I mean, you know, that's my story. I was diagnosed uh, manic depressant, that manic depressant back before bipolar was popular. And, um, and and I don't know whether they asked me about my drug and alcohol use and I lied to them or they didn't ask. It's one of those two, right? It's one or the other. And uh, so what I asked them to do 
was to go back to the person that did the prescribing and give them an accurate drug and alcohol history. We'll begin there. Now, what I know that I don't tell them is if this person leaves you on it with that information, I'm going to take you to an MD in town who's carrying a 15-year chip. And we're going to see what he thinks. And if he thinks you need to be on it, then, then I'm going to be out of the discussion. And, you know, I, both of them, you know, whoever did the prescribing said, you what? And they're off of it and they're doing just fine. I'm saying I believe there probably are people who need to be on that stuff. But this is what I do with someone who's new who shows up that way. And just sharing my experience here. Um, when I asked Don Roy to sponsor me, he told me how to drop my previous sponsor. I called on a Friday uh, to tell Mike that I'd asked someone else to sponsor me. I left him a message, a voicemail, and I used the need word. I said, Mike, I need to talk to you. I left him a voicemail on Friday. The following Tuesday afternoon, he responded to my call. This is one of the two or three most spiritual men I have ever known. He is that today. The reason I was changing was that his life got so full that I wasn't able to get what I knew I needed. I'm in the middle of a divorce, and this guy can't call me back for four days, and he wasn't out of town. And it's because his life was so full. That's a good reason to change. And I said to him what Don had told me to say. I said, thank you. Thank you for all you've given me. Thank you for all I've learned. Thank you for the time and effort you've put into me. God knows you've been a blessing in my life. It's only fair for me to tell you I've asked someone else to sponsor me. And adults don't have to answer questions. If he'd asked, I would have told him, told him I think he knew. And if he gets upset about that, the one thing I know for sure is I've done the right thing dropping him is because he got his ego tied up in sponsoring me. I had two, two very close friends drop me a couple of years ago for the same reason. I do this a lot. And they both thought they needed someone who was a lot more available. I said, go with God. You bet. I'm still close to both of those guys. I'm not mad. I'm not offended by that. I think they did the right thing. That just happened to me again a couple of weeks ago. I think he did the right thing. I told him so. Um, and, and he's got a sponsor. If he's upset, he's got a sponsor to process that with, or I wouldn't let him sponsor me in the first place. So how he feels about me changing is not my problem and I don't need to adopt it. I'm a poor enough father to the few problems I've actually got. I can't be adopting any. All right, so I don't need to fix him. But I need to thank him because he deserves that. And that, that's, that's what I learned. Uh, I love the temporary sponsor idea, the newcomer coming through the door. He doesn't need a commitment. He needs a sponsor. Let's call it a temporary sponsor. Let's tell him, I, you know, change if you want to. I'm not offended. Just let me know. Just let me know. And here's your first assignment. Let, let's get going. <laughs> right. Yeah. Because I only know one way to do it. And I ask the guys I sponsor to do that. Sure, be a temporary sponsor. But you only know one way to sponsor. Sponsor them that way. This Mike I was just telling you about, this very spiritual guy. I'm not kidding. I got a five-year chip in my pocket. I call him one day and I say, rah, 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 this guy I'm sponsoring. What should I do? And he says, I want you to drop him. I said, come on, Mike. He, he, fire is what he said. The big book uses the term drop. I said, come on, I'm being serious. He said, I'm being serious. I said, I don't believe you. He said, I would rather have you on the golf course than working with this guy. It would be better for your spiritual program. Well, Mike has never heard me play golf, <laughs> clearly. <laughs> yeah. And I said, I don't get it, Mike. And he said, let me ask you some questions. He said, what are you asking him to do that he's not doing? I said, well, let's see. Call me every day. Look for a job. Go to a meeting every day. Call his parole officer. Begin his four-step and open and close his days, following the directions on 86 and 87. He said, well, how much of that's he doing? I said, he's not doing any of it. He said, you are not his sponsor. He is. You are his fire chief. And when his tail feathers are ablaze, he calls you and siphons off some of your serenity and puts out his fire and goes right back to doing it his way, and you are not helping him. You are co-signing a lie. And the lie is that he has a sponsor and that he's in the program, and neither of those is true. He's in the fellowship. He's not in the program because the program's the 12 steps, and he is not allowing you to coach him through them. And he doesn't have a sponsor because he's not doing what you ask. And then he said, how do you feel when you work with him? And I said, I feel like they pulled the corks out of my heels and the blood ran out. I feel like I've been wrung out. He said, yeah. He said, how do you feel when you work with Bill Kay? I said, oh, he lights me up like Chinese New Year's. He said, really? What are you asking Bill to do that he's not doing? I said, well, he's doing it all. He said, mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. He says, you can tell not each time, but by and large, how you feel when you work with somebody, whether it's working or not. And sponsorship is always a two-way street. If it's working for one, it's, there aren't any one-way streets in the kingdom. If it's working for one, it's working for both. If it's not working for one, it's not working for either one. 
And he said, do you think you could stay sober on the program he's working? I said, no. He said, do you think he can? I said, no. He said, you are probably right. And when he drinks again, I want you to be able to sleep because he might die or kill somebody else or go to prison for a long stretch as a result. And I want you to be able to sleep knowing that you told him the truth because the truth is he ain't in the program and he doesn't have a sponsor. I learned another one since then. And that's that the, the next time he wakes up in a jail cell in a pool of his own blood and vomit, I want him to have three options. And the three options are to continue to live that way, to commit suicide, or to try the program of Alcoholics Anonymous knowing he hasn't tried it because I told him the truth. Because if I don't, if I don't tell him the truth, he can sit on bar stools and say, I tried A and it doesn't work for me and believe it. So I must tell him the truth because if I don't, I've killed him. I've killed him. And I went with a very heavy heart. And, and if this guy had said, give me one more chance, I would have said, okay. I've learned a lot about it since, and he did not say that. And the next time I saw him was a couple days later, and he bounced off of both door jams coming into the clubhouse. We shared a parking lot with a grocery store, and he was arrested. The cops came into that meeting, and he left his car parked up against somebody else's in the grocery parking lot. And that's the last time we saw him. And I did not throw away his shot at recovery. He did. Before you come disagree with me on this one, I'd ask you to read the middle paragraph on page 95 and the first paragraph on 96. We're not going to it. That's where the book says this stuff. But I had to have a guy tell me about it. Uh, There's a guy that shows up in my home group every 6 to 18 months. He was just there a couple of months ago. He always finds me. We've been doing this for over a decade. And he said, I know I didn't do what you did last time, but I'm really serious this time, man. Please, if you'll sponsor me, I'll do absolutely anything. I say, okay. And then I just make up an assignment. doesn't matter what it is. There's no wrong assignment. The question is, does he do it? So, all right, I want you to read the first eight pages in Bill's story. I want you to look up at least one word on every page in the dictionary. Call me tonight at 8.15. I want to hear what the words were. He didn't call. He doesn't think he's got a sponsor, and I don't think he does. And I'm not throwing away his chance. I'm not co-signing a lie. One of these times he's going to call. He's going to have eight definitions. We're going to rock and roll. Yeah, it's not up to me. It's not up to me. There was a... There was a uh, I think it was Chicago. There was a, meet, a story in the grapevine 15 years ago. The guy's fixing to start answering phones at the central office. I'm pretty sure it was a major city. I'm pretty sure it was Chicago. It occurred to him it was life or death, and it scared him badly. And he went to an old-timer and expressed his concern. The old-timer said, don't worry about it. If they're ready, you can't do it wrong. If they're not ready, you can't do it right. It's not up to you. And I believe that's the first rule of sponsorship. If he's ready, I can't do it wrong. If he's not ready, I can't do it right. It's not going to be up to me. It's going to be up to him. I am I able to lay out the simple kit of spiritual tools. I can't make him pick them up. My Uncle Frank used to say, some people are just naturally hard to help. <laughs> That's been my experience. Yeah. And continuing to try to help them just frustrates me, and it doesn't do them any good. I do them a great service when I drop them. And there was, there was a guy in my home group, and, and I don't know how many times I tried to drop him. He said, no, give me one more chance. I said, okay, read Dr. Bob's story and look up two words on every page and call me tonight. And he calls tonight, and here we go. And three weeks later, I'm putting more energy into his recovery than he is. And I drop him again. He said, no, 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 I'll do anything. And sure enough, he does for the week or so. I finally talked to my sponsor about it. And he said, the next time you drop him, make it stick. And I had to do it again a couple of weeks later. I said, Jerry, that's it. We're done. I can't sponsor you. He said, no, I'll do anything. And I said, no, Jerry. There's a country song that says, give me one more last chance. <laughs> You've had your last chance. I'm going to last chance you into your grave. You're dropped. I hope you will get with another member of our group who's done the steps. I hope you will surrender to somebody. He says it in public every time he gets a chance. I saved his life that day because he was just playing the game. And he found another long-term member of my group who's done the work and has surrendered to him, and he's on fire. I saved his life. I think it's one of the great spiritual truths. If it's right for one person, it's right for both. If it's wrong for one, it's wrong for both. It's the way it is. I'm sad about that. And I'll tell you, it breaks my heart. I've coached everyone. I've got one new guy that I hadn't sponsoring yet. I've coached all the rest of them at least once through dropping somebody. And, and I would say, God, it just tears my guts up. I said, I hope it does. Who are you if it doesn't? Because this guy's not going to make it this time. I hope it tears your guts up to have to go drop this guy. I hope it tears your heart out. Hope it does every time. Who are you if it doesn't? But it's the right thing to do. You're doing him a favor and you're doing you a favor. At the secret sponsor school that you've always suspected was there, I'll, I'll admit that it really is. 
Did you ever wonder how your sponsor knows when you're full of it? Well, there's a key phrase they teach, and all after this phrase is BS, and the phrase is, yes, but. All after is BS. You just wonder, that's, that's, that's where that comes from. Uh, <laughs> um, page 164. Just do a little piece of that. I am going to run out of time. Second to last line, third to last, the fellowship of the Spirit, you will surely meet some of us as you trudge the road to happy destiny, is not what it says. It says the road of happy destiny. The road is the destiny. Right now, right this second, this is the destiny. Then my wife says, this is the future we used to be terrified of. Right this second. You guys okay? Everybody all right? Everybody all right? Okay, good. How about now? How about now? The road of happy destiny. And I asked my sponsor, what's trudge? And he said, some days it's crawling over broken glass, other days it's cartwheels. It averages out at about trudge. <laughs> it means to walk with purpose. Um, the first time Bob and I did one of these, I, it was four, coming up on four years ago, four years next month. I flew into Las Vegas, and we drove from Las Vegas to Los Angeles. And on the way across, his cell phone rings. And this is his side of the conversation. He won't tell this, but I will. This is sponsorship. His cell phone rings. And I hear his side of the conversation, yeah, hey, oh, I'm sorry to hear that. Oh, no, oh, yeah, I bet she means it this time. Oh, yeah, this is definitely over. And I know you're brokenhearted. It's Friday afternoon. I'll be home Sunday about midnight. I want you to have two new men to sponsor by the time I get back. You know where they are. Go get them. (laughs) That is fabulous sponsorship. We're going to get you out of the problem and into somebody else right now. And, and I've heard him, heard him, I learned this from him a, a year or so ago doing one of these. I'll, I'll add it to some. I, I used to sponsor a guy named Buff, and uh, Buff had terminal cancer. And he was sober in the mid-teens when he died of it. And a, a, a couple of months before he died, he'd gone home to die, and a, couple, a Chainsaw Mike and some of the other great guys that he sponsored came to me, and they said, what do we do? How, how, what do we do here? And I said, you take him your hangnails. He's laying there dying of cancer, and he needs your hangnails. The way Bob said it so poetically is that when you bring me your hangnail, when I've got a big deal going on, it puts an island of focus on you into this sea of me that I'm awash in, and I need those islands. When i got a big deal and I'm hurting badly, I need the hangnails from the guys that I sponsor. They save me. They take me out of myself, which is what I need. Um. I start, my, the business partner that put me in treatment, I divorced a year later. Uh, he and I were stealing $25,000 a year in 1985 from our own company each through our expense account. That was our agreed-upon number. That is not an estimate. And uh, it took me a year to realize that it was at least possible that was in violation of the spiritual principles I was trying to live by. I'm not a quick study. And... Um, I told him we had to quit that, and he, and he hated the IRS worse than communism, and he wanted him out. And so we divorced. I started a new business, and uh, just a couple of months later, it was clear that this thing was going to crash and burn, and I couldn't think about anything else. It cost me my spirituality, and I really had it at that time. It was just a fabulous thing. It had been gone for two weeks when I realized it was gone, and all I'm thinking about is this business. And I go to you, and I say, what should I do? And they say, turn it over. I say, how? And they say, well, just turn it over. Well, how? And they can't tell me. So I prayed about it. This is what I got. Welcome to it if you can use it. What I did was I figured out what was the worst possible case in my eyes. And it was this, that I would lose the business, go bankrupt, lose the house, lose one of the cars, and have to get a real job working for somebody else. That was as ugly as I could see it. And so I took that to God in prayer because I figured if I could turn over the worst case, I'd have it all turned over. And I said, if this is your will, send it. And I didn't mean it. See, that was the problem. That was the problem, was I didn't mean it. And I prayed that morning and night whenever I thought about the business until I meant it. It's been too long, and I think it was about 10 days to two weeks. And all of a sudden, there was a moment, and I just meant it, that I had stepped back into the sunlight. I had had something between me and God, and I was living in the icy shadow. And I had stepped out from behind it. And if that's what he's got in mind, I'm in. I'm in. I'm back to in. That God's will is the best deal there is. Maybe somebody else needs to see me go through this. Whatever he's got in mind for me is good. I'll take it. And and it was just a glorious moment. I just had this tremendous feeling. Three days later, that business made a 180 and took off like a turpentine cat. And I don't, 
Yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry. Where is she? I'm sorry. Thank you. I'll take that one out too. And, but it really took off. And, um, and I'm not saying that the business change was cause and effect, but I know that those prayers are how I turned it over. So how do I turn it over to God? I stay in this day, and I'd be comfortable with the idea that whatever he sends is okay with me. It was difficult for me to understand this piece, and that's that pain is my friend. Pain is my best friend. It's what tells me something is wrong. My first marriage quit working somewhere right around six months before we said the vows. Somewhere right in there. And I bled off the pain from that through a series, and I'm not proud of this, through booze and drugs and a series of illicit affairs for years. And I believe if I hadn't done that, if I'd lived in that pain, that we would have either gotten help or gotten out of it several decades before we did. I must respect pain. It is my friend. It's what tells me something is wrong. I've got to be careful that I don't bleed it off in an illicit fashion because it just tears me up. It, it keeps me from having any hope, really. But I'm going to tell a couple of more quick ones. We're just going to have to run long. Uh, anonymity. Bob and I, as you may have noticed, give our last names in AA meetings in keeping with our tradition of anonymity. If that doesn't make any sense to you, I'd like to recommend the pamphlet, Understanding Anonymity, and the book, Dr. Bob and the Good Old Timers, somewhere between page 260 and 270, where Dr. Bob suggested that failure to give my last name in an AA meeting is in conflict with our tradition of anonymity. We're not, we're not a secret society. We're anonymous at the public level. You guys need to be, we need to be able to find each other. There are exceptions to that. I've been in meetings with federal judges, with, with people who need to be anonymous even within the fellowship. Uh, we see a lot of stars in Nashville. They need to be just George, you know, instead of whoever. And um, so there are exceptions. But by and large, we need to be able to find each other. My name is Scott Lee. I'm in the phone book in Nashville, Tennessee. Coming through? Give me a call. Give me a couple days lead time. We'll take you to jail. What an offer. <laughs> Where else would you get an offer like that? Well, I mean, somebody in your home group goes into the hospital. You walk up to the reception desk and say, pardon me, ma'am, is Janet from another planet still in 401? <laughs> right? What room's Chainsaw Mike in? I mean, they can't help you with that. So we, we need to be able to find each other. <clears throat> and uh, the other piece of anonymity that I don't think we talk about nearly enough is doing something nice for somebody else and not getting caught. I touched it uh, last night about turning the penny over in the parking place and all that stuff. I had an experience years ago where I had an opportunity to do something really good for somebody, and I did it. And no one knew. And what happened is that there was a piece of sunshine about the size of a ping pong ball lodged itself in my chest. And I could think about what I'd done any time. And this thing would glow and send light through my whole body. And I see people nodding who know what I'm talking about. So I never told a soul for about six months. <laughs> and when I told it got out. And I'm going to tell you because there was another beautiful lesson that came on the back end. What had happened was I'm a commissioned salesman. I had one of those magical days where I walk in on my first call at 8 o'clock in the morning, and the receptionist says, he's ready for you. I walk in, the buyer says, haven't got time to talk today. Here's your order. And at noon, my day's over. I got nothing to do, nowhere to go. I got fishing gear in the trunk. There's a state park, a stream. I'm fishing. There's a family. They got a 7-year-old boy. It looks like he and I are going to fish together today. I'm going to cast. He's going to do everything else the way it looks. Caught a couple of fish. This kid at seven is a fisherman. He's never fished before in his life. That's my story. I meet his family. I'm at a time in my life where I've got time, and I started taking him fishing. Took him on a couple of short trips, and he had it. He had as bad a case as I do. When he was eight, he and I launched a canoe on the Buffalo River. It's an hour west of Nashville, Tennessee. It's the National Scenic River. And I say I like to think there may be places in heaven almost as beautiful as the Buffalo River. And this kid and I floated five miles of river that day in about 10 hours. We caught over 100 fish that day. It was one of the magic days. Kid caught a four-pound smallmouth bass, man. He got my fish is what happened. <laughs> about, a mile from the, about, about a mile from the takeout, and so the walls are straight up, and the sky blackens, and I hear the thunder. We're going to get it. And I did what canoeists call eddy out. There's a little backwater, and I caught a pulled over and parallel parked under these trees. And I'm about to give God a little piece of Did you happen to notice St. Scott down here, by the way? And I took this boy, and he's caught my feet. About to do this prayer. <laughs> and this beautiful little guy looks over his shoulder at me, and he says, Is it okay to fish here? 
And that was one of the great lessons of my life. I've got This was given to me by someone when I spoke one time. It's okay to fish here. See, because I prayed the third step prayer and I meant it. I prayed the seventh step prayer and I meant it. And the rest of my life's none of my business. And when the skies in my life black it and I hear the thunder and I know I'm fixing to get it, I think that's the prayer I'm supposed to take to my father. Is it okay to fish here? Because you see, that's my assignment. I understand. That's my job. Is it okay to fish here? It is. That's what it says. It's okay to fish here. My uh, my last flight in a high performance airplane, and I knew it was my last flight. I leveled at forty thousand feet. That's that's this bird here that I got the picture of. If you noticed it, I'm leveled at forty thousand feet three and a half minutes after brake release. They give me a thirty mile circle around a point with an altitude block where there'll be nobody else because if you're going to play at seven hundred miles an hour, they have to give you some room. It's one of the rules. I thought it was a pretty good rule. And um, they gave me too much altitude, and uh, I, uh, I eased the throttles back out of afterburner. The fuel gauges moved kind of fast in afterburner. Pulled the nose up a little bit, rolled into 15 degrees of bank. I started climbing in this circle. They told, I'm starting at 40. They told us not to go above 45,000 feet. And they told us a couple of times a week not to go above 45. And they said there were two reasons. One is that you could die. The other is that you would also owe them an airplane. And <laughs> because there are things that happen at high altitude that you do not recover from that don't happen at lower altitude. Don't go above 45. That was back in the days before the radar gave them your altitude, and they were having to take my word for it, and I'm sure they were making other mistakes at the time too. And um, at, at 52,300, she was done. Yeah, I'm 7,000 7, feet higher than I'm supposed to be. And uh, another 500 feet would have been 10 miles. I thought I was going to make it. just wouldn't do it. I have not looked. I did an instrument climb. I rolled out on a northerly heading, and I looked for the first time. 9.30 in the morning on a clear day, 80 miles west of Jacksonville, Florida, out over the Okefenokee Swamp. The sun's coming up over my right shoulder. The sky above me is black. I'm looking up through a bubble canopy at 9.30 in the morning on a clear day. The sky is black at 52,300. I looked out to the west and saw the curvature of the earth, and I didn't see it a little bit. I really saw it. This thing we're riding is a ball. It's this magnificent blue ball. It's floating in space, and I claim it's held there by love. I didn't see anything else. I had a physical sensation like something warm had been poured over me and ran down me like like it might run down a candle. In the poem High Flight, the author says, I reached out my hand and touched the face of God. And I did that that morning. Men who do that now, and I'll tell you what, in 1967, there weren't many that had done that. Not many. I was one of them. Today, when they do that, that's the nickname they've given it. The guys who fly those planes who are able to go do that call it touching the face of God. I sat there for about two minutes and looked at eternity. And I was shaken in the most beautiful way. And I eased the throttles back and I brought it down. I shot one approach and landed. And um, I couldn't tell them. I might have been the town drunk. I'm not the village idiot. I don't tell them. You know, this... uh, this will be the one. We'll get the court martial out of this one for sure. <laughs> and, uh, I didn't tell about the whole time I was, I was uh, in the service, and I was sober eight years, and I talked at Burke Harlan, Harlan's 12-year birthday. Get one of Burke's talks. You want to hear something. He was one of my teachers. And um, I, I, uh, I heard myself telling this story, and I said, I don't know why I'm telling this, and you know. It was my first spiritual experience, and I didn't realize it until I was sober eight years. For over 30 years, I won't, you can't do that. For over 30 years, I wanted to see the curvature of the earth again. In 2004, my little business had a pretty good year. And me and Miss Linda, we went out to the airport, and we chartered a Learjet. I can't ride the front row. I'm not qualified. I'm in the back with her. A Lear 31 will go to 51,000 feet. Would you like to know how I know that? Yeah. The weather conditions have to be perfect. You've got to have crystal clear to see it from that altitude, but it can be done. I used to sit in cockpits of airplanes and say to other pilots, I can't even believe they pay us to do this. And I walked away from my dream because I'm an alcoholic. Alcoholism took away all of my dreams. And Alcoholics Anonymous brought them all back. I serve a big God. I have learned to dream big. I hope you learn to dream big. Bob, sorry I ran so long. Bob Darrell, I'm an alcoholic. Hey, Bob. Before I leave, I want to thank you all for being here. I've yeah. made some great connections with some of you. 
Uh, I hope you stay in touch with me. By now, we've uh, tuned up and fit the tractor, put the plow on it. Now we're getting ready to plow the field and plant the seeds to really carry out our primary purpose. Everything up to this point is, is just to serve one end so we can be relieved of the bondage of self by carrying out our primary purpose. I sponsor a guy named Dave who it, I met him in Las Vegas many years ago. He's double-digit sobriety. I, when I met him, he shook his hand. He had a finger missing. I said, what do you do for a living? He said, I do bomb disposal. I said, you're not very good at it, are you? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Dave, a few years ago, moved to San Diego. I still sponsor him, and I talk to him regularly. And uh, became the H&I chairman down there. He probably does more hospital and institution meetings per week than anyone in the whole of San Diego County. He sponsors the guys no one else will sponsor, the hopeless cases. And, and a lot of them are staying sober. And Dave got cancer. And Dave, it was lymphatic. That's not good. And the one hope they had for Dave was they had to subject him to one of the most deadly regiments of chemotherapy and radiation at the same time that's, that they can give a human being. It was brutal. It was so bad they had to pull all his teeth out uh, because they were going to radiate him here in these glands, and they also had to put a tube in his stomach to feed him through because he won't be able his, his, he's gonna be, his throat's going to be burnt so badly that he won't be able to swallow. And Dave would call me up. And all these newcomers, he's helped surround him, and he would call me up, and he would get me crying because he'd always end the phone call. He says, I really need to know something. I said, what, what's that, Dave? He said, I really need to know if there's anything I can do for you. And, ah, uh, fuck. I mean, wow. And every time he call, a couple times a week he calls me up and he always says, is there anything, I just need to know, is there anything I can do for you? Now, he is the finest example of Alcoholics Anonymous I know. To the death, he gets it. And he is a free man. In the midst, in the midst of an, a grueling regimen of chemotherapy and radiation, he is a free man. Because there's only thing, he doesn't need to be free of his cancer. He only ever needed to be free of one thing, the bondage of self. And he got it. He, is, he has been crafted by the 12 steps of Alcoholics Anonymous to, to fulfill his, become whole with his purpose. And that's to be a lover. That's the point. Chapter 7 is a sponsorship manual. It is a point-by-point point direction that we're not going to have time to go into, but it's very specific. When I, when I, uh, when I started following the procedure in this book, I started becoming more effective. Prior to that, I was a loose cannon sponsor, and all I had to bring with to you was my ego. You're going to stay sober if I have to break your legs because I'm going to look bad if you don't. You know what I mean? It became all about me. I was fixing guys. I was doing – I'd get guys jobs. I'd go to somebody and they'd say, give my guy a job. And they give him the job. He'd get drunk, rob them. You know, oh, no. I'll tell, tell you one little story. The book says, book says don't do this. I, I had a sponsee that uh, – he, did, he wouldn't do anything. He, he won't work the steps. He won't even go to meetings unless I go pick him up. All he wants to use me for is a person to whine to about his problems. And he's, and he's, got, these, he's got these warrants out for his arrest in another state. And he's whining about, well, I don't really feel, I'm not ready for the steps. I, well, I work the steps. I'm going to probably go to jail. And, you know, oh, it was, oh, it was pathetic. Well, I've I've not worked the steps myself, really. I've I've been dabbling at them, and I haven't read, I haven't studied working with others, so I don't know what I'm doing. And there's a guy named Roger Foley. If you ever come to Las Vegas, there's a big federal building there. It's named after him. He was a federal judge, 
And Roger was a very powerful man, and I didn't know that. I just knew he was a good guy at the men's stag I go to, right? And he liked me. And I went to Roger one day, and I lied to him. And I went to Roger, and I said, I'm working with so-and-so, and and he really wants to be sober. Well, he doesn't really. The truth, here's the truth. I'm working with so-and-so, and I really want him to be sober. That's the truth. And then I lied to him again, and I said, oh, and he's really doing AA. Well, he's not doing nothing. The, what the truth is, is I really want him to do AA. And I think if I can somehow help him be relieved, fix these warrants somehow, he'll be so grateful he'll stay sober forever and mention my name a lot, right? <laughs> and, the, and, the new, and the old timers are going to go, Bob's, did you see how Bob helped that guy? <laughs> did you see that? I could, you, could, you can kind of feel the, the cement going into place for the statue of you in New York, you know, at the, the World Service office. So I tell Roger, oh, listen, Roger, gets his, he says, get me his social security number and everything and all these details, and I did. And Roger made a few phone calls, and I don't know how he did it. It's none of my business. The warrants disappeared. The guy was drunk within a week. And he's never, as far as I, if he's ever gotten sober again, it's not been in Las Vegas. I might as well have stuck a gun to his head. I robbed him of the one thing that had brought him to us, was keeping him with us, and eventually would have broken and worn out his spirit, and he would have had to eventually either drink or surrender. Because you get to that point. It's either, it's either shoot, it's either kill yourself, drink, or work the steps. Right? You get to that point. And I, I, I enabled him to, I took the pressure off, which freed him up. Now he doesn't need AA. He was able to leave, right? Um, there's an old adage, if you uh, give a man a fish, he'll, he'll eat for a day. If you teach him how to fish, he'll eat for a lifetime. It is in the 12th step that I was able to survive myself in my early sobriety until I could start to have a spiritual experience through the steps. Uh, I didn't understand for a long time why the old timers were hammering me to go on 12 step calls and take, go into these meetings in the hospitals. When I was two months sober, they got me cleared to take meetings into the state prison. You can't even do that today. Today you got to have two years. You got to go to classes. I've been grandfathered in, in the prison system for almost 30 years. And I've been going into those places. I've been going twice a week. Um, I've changed it around. I used to do the mission in the Salvation Army. Now I do the detox in the county jail. And actually, I'm doing it three times a week now. And I've been doing that stuff. And i got to tell you, I didn't understand why I was doing it for a while, why these old-timers are hammering me. You know, that when at first, I, I, I tried to argue with them. I said, you know, I know what you're saying. And I kind of I didn't tell them this, but I suspected AA had a membership problem or something and they <clears throat> wanted me to help them out you know but but i wasn't really ready yet and i told him that i said you know i i understand you want me to go out and help these people but i i don't really feel ready yet and this guy said to me he says listen kid if you wait until you feel ready before you try to help anybody you'll have already died of alcoholism just go do it and so i went and started doing it and i didn't I didn't do it right. I made more mistake. I probably did more harm than good, but it kept me sober. Because I'm the kind of guy, I'm the alcoholic of the Bill Wilson type. And I bet you <clears throat> there's people in this room that are like me. When I quit drinking, I, I easily get diagnosed as clinically depressed. When I quit drinking, I just get my life and my emotions on me like that creature and alien that attaches itself to your face. Right? And I don't know, it looks like clinical depression, but it's not. It's spiritual depression. It's the depression of the obsessively, overly self-involved. That my world is all closed in around me and my spirit is smothering here. And I'm depressed and alone and full of self-pity, and I can't get free. Now, there was a time when four shots of tequila would fix that. But four shots of tequila don't fix it no more. Now I'm stuck in a trap I can't spring, and these old-timers are, are having me do these 12-step calls, and, all, and 
And I don't get it. I, I, I'm, I'm slow because I think in terms of events and absolutes. So I don't see that there's something happening to me. And what's happening to me is I'm getting these little periods where I actually are, are, are sort of feel a little free. I'm feeling good, little islands in my day. Or I'm spending time with some guy and he's all screwed up and, and, all, and I don't even get that. I, God, I felt really good when I was with him trying to help him because I go right back to me again and being right back to me I judge it well this isn't working but it worked for that period of time right that's like saying that'd be like saying uh, the next morning when you're hung over well that alcohol didn't even get me high because you're hung because you're not high now but you were last night and I don't get it and one night I come home and I'm uh, I'm sitting in the uh, on the sofa, and I'm, I've been to two meetings that day. I've talked to my sponsor. I've prayed, and I'm sinking into a deep depression. I, uh, I'd had a relationship end pr- prior to that, and I'm pondering that. I'm pondering my financial situation. I, I don't know what it is about me. I have never pondered my life for any length of time and came away joyous. I, I never noticed that. I, I just never have done that. I, I just, it's just, it's bleak. It's like I'm going into the abyss, you know. I, it's the more I look at my life, the bleaker it looks. The future, uh, I'm going to be alone, poor, broken, and old folks home eating alpo one day. I know it, you know. I, I just know it, and. And, and I, it's really bad. And when you're drinking, with a, if you have a bottle of vodka and you're feeling sorry for yourself, there's a little mushiness about it. <laughs> Sober, it's not fun, man. I'm telling you, it's bad. And I'm looking at the clock, and it's, it's going on 10 o'clock at night. Uh, I'm scared. I'm afraid. I don't know where a drink, a drink comes up in this deal, this progression of feelings I'm going through. But it's, it's in there somewhere. And, so I say a little prayer. I, I say, God, please help me. And I look at the clock, and I remembered that there's a meeting at 10.15, not too far from my apartment. So I guess through God's grace and a little bit of effort, I muscled myself off that couch. Couch. I, I felt like I weighed 1,000 pounds. I was so depressed. And I shuffled out to my car like a mope, and I got in the car, and I drove to the meeting. And there was a parking space right in front of the entrance to the chapel where the meeting was. And I parked right there. And I go in the meeting, I'm sitting in the back of the room, but I can't hear nothing. Because what's going on in the meeting is like music in a doctor's office. It's so far away from me. Because the big show's on the inside. And it's, it's spiritually sick people reverse our relationship with reality. Spiritually sick people, what happens in the here and now is distant and vague because their focus is on here. Healthy people, their focus and presence is here. The chatter in your head is like music in a doctor's office. It doesn't, they don't pay much attention to it. But I've, when you're real sick, you reverse that, right? So I'm disconnected, disassociated from life itself. So if God's trying to talk to me through the people in the meeting, nothing's getting in. And I'm sitting there and I'm pondering my life and it's, it's brutal. And there's a guy across from me sitting there and he's coming off a drunk and he's in bad bad shape he's he sit he can't sit still he gra- he's grabbing himself and he's rocking back and forth like he wants to jump out of his skin and he can't sit very long then he gets up and he's pacing back and forth behind me like a caged animal and then periodically there's a bathroom there and he goes in there you can hear him in there dry heaving and you know i have a lot of problems in my life i'm trying to figure out and this guy's just annoying the crap out of me <laughs> The meeting is over. I, I, the, I have not, the meeting has not helped me. I feel worse because it's one of those meetings where from way down inside of me, I peek out and I, all I see and hear is everybody's doing better than I am. You know what I mean? Right? And I, I stay after the meeting to help the guy, Charlie, who's the secretary with the trash and the chairs and everything to put the chapel back together the way it's supposed to. And Charlie and I are the last two guys to leave the meeting. Charlie's on his way to work. He works a graveyard shift at a casino. 
we're locking up and we're standing on the front porch of the chapel. We're looking across to my car. The guy who's coming off the drunk is laying on the ground in front of my car in a fetal position. Now, I will have to step over him to go home and ponder my life more deeply. <laughs> Which I am ashamed to tell you I probably would have done, except Charlie's there. Charlie's got a big mouth. And if I don't help this guy, Charlie's going to tell everybody in AA what a lousy member I am, right? See, even the worst thing about you, your ego, sometimes can save your life in God's hands. And so I, uh, Charlie can't help, and I'm looking at this guy. And I go over to him, and he's a mess. He's peed his pants, and he stinks, and... And he's, he's afraid he's going to go into seizures. He has no medical insurance. So imagine the inconsideration of that. He has no money set aside for detox or nothing. And, and at that time, there was no free detox in Las Vegas. You had, there, there was two alternatives when you got a guy like this that might go into seizures. And one of them is you could sit with a guy around the clock, give him a shot of vodka about every hour, hour and a half. And we used to do that, and I thank God I've had that experience of sitting with a guy, watching him flop around on the floor. Um, I know guys that are sober today that I watched flop around one time. Um, but I couldn't do that. You need two guys, and I had to go to work in the morning. There was only one other alternative, and that's to take him to the county hospital. And, and they would take a certain amount of indigent patients. I'd been down there before on 12-step calls, but it's brutal. They, they have this awful attitude towards you. They, they treat you like you're a redheaded stepchild. They, they, just, they have this attitude like, well, we'd rather treat legitimate sick people than these self-induced guys that are probably going to be back here next month anyway. So you get this guy and you go down there as I went and I'm going my way down there and I know I'm going to be sitting down there all night. And I got to get up for work in the morning. I'm going to be tired. I'm a bad attitude. I'll probably get in a beef with my boss. I'll lose my job, but it's a lousy job anyway. <laughs> Isn't it enough that I got all these problems? I got to do this too. Doesn't anybody else step up to the plate nay, except me? The key word is me me so we get down there we sign in and we're sitting in the waiting room this guy's coming apart at the seams and he's starting to tell me about himself and he's starting to tell me about the remorse and the shame that he feels for all the loved ones he'd hurt and how he can't even really drink it away anymore and he tells me that for some time he's been thinking about killing himself and he just doesn't seem to have the courage and then he really gets me. He says to me, he says, I don't know why you're wasting time with me. He says, I'm not like you people in AA. He says, I can't stay sober. I always drink again. And he's telling me about me. And in the wee hours of the morning, I fell in love with that guy. I, I, I tell you something, honest to God, there was a spot there when I wanted him to be happy and free and have a good life and be sober probably more than I wanted it for me. I loved the guy. And I don't know why I loved him for no reason. Really, he can't help me, can't get me a better job. He's probably not even going to stay sober a year and give me some kind of credit for something, right? <laughs> this guy can't do nothing for me except that he suffered from alcoholism exactly like suffer I suffered from alcoholism and I fell in love with him. And I found out later that what had happened is what I fell in love with was the me that is in him. A me that I needed to love and could not love directly. I had to love it through you. And I know I tried. I had a therapist at one time that was real big on self-love. She used to hammer me. you got to learn to love yourself. She, she gave me these positive affirmations. I'm supposed to stand in front of the mirror and look myself in the eye and say over and over again, God loves me. God forgives me. God accepts me. I love me. I forgive me. I accept me. What a bunch of bullshit. Uh, and I could have stood there and said that till the planet blew up and it wouldn't have changed how I felt about me. Not one bit. But I started to change the way I felt about me through steps 9 and through steps 12. It's where It was where the restoration came. Um, 
they eventually checked him in to that hospital and they gave him a bed. And the sun's coming up and it's the wee hours of the morning and I'm driving home and I'm crying. And I'm, I'm not crying because I'm depressed. I'm crying because I finally connected the dots. I'm crying because I never felt more perfect about my life, more useful and more right about everything. There was a divine order and a sense of security and a presence of God in my life that was unbelievable. And I knew at that moment why the old timers had been hammering me to do 12-step work. They knew that even as as self-obsessed, self-absorbed, self-focused, and narcissistically self-involved as I was, that if I stayed in that venue and that arena long enough, one day you'd hear a loud pop as my head came out of my butt and I'd actually show up in the realm of the spirit. Right? And that was the morning, not only was I relieved of the bondage of self, but I was relieved of the bondage of self and I woke up to it. And I understood that this is the way I want to feel the rest of my life. A friend of mine, a guy I sponsor, he says, talks about 12-step work and he says, oh, that's the good dope. <laughs> and if you're, if you're sitting here and you suffer from emotional disorders... And you've done everything in Alcoholics Anonymous except devote your entire life to helping others. Try that. I'll give you a little experiment. Maybe you're, maybe you're thinking you need a better therapist. Maybe you need to work on you more. For the next 30 days, let's, let's indulge that. For the next 30 days... Let's focus on you and work on you and improve you and do for you and enhance you and make you better. And if, if you survive. If you survive that 30 days <laughs> and you haven't blown your brains out, let's spend 30 days where every breathing moment you exist to help God's kids. And if you have the same sickness of your spirit that I have, it will become very, very apparent the road you need to be on and the purpose that is in your life. It becomes very apparent. Mm -hmm. That's why this is, it says nothing will so much ensure immunity from drinking like intensive. Intensive, which means, oh, I did a 12-step call last month. At halftime? Halftime. I took a phone call. There's no end to my goodness. No. In, intensive means in, it, it, it means it, it means you need to work with others just as much as you think about yourself. Oh my God. <laughs> Whoa, what a, I won't have any time for me. Yeah, that's the point. That's the point. That's the point. You've had plenty of time for you. Look what happened. Oh, we don't. We don't want you to get into yourself. We're saying, Bob, step away from yourself. <laughs> Why do we need sponsors? Well, medical science says the use of drugs and alcohol destroy brain cells. So by the time we get here, most of us have a half a brain. <laughs> You need your sponsor so you can be one person. <laughs> right. 12-step <laughs> work has, has saved my life. Sponsoring people has saved my life. When I was in my uh, 11th year of sobriety, I went through a horrendous divorce. It was only horrendous at the time. It was one of the, My sponsor told me the truth, and I, it became true. It was one of the best things that ever happened to me. But I'll tell you, I was in the middle of it. I'd never been anything. I'd never been anything more painful than this. And I found out I have a daughter who's she's almost 21, who I just adore. At the time, she was just a little baby girl. She's such a cute thing. I just adored her. And my my wife and daughter moved in with after the day after the divorce with my best friend, a guy that I sponsored, who'd been my confidant in my marriage problems. And I eventually went back and did the four-step process on it and got free and got to make the amends to them. And, it, and we're very, very close today. But what saved me through all of that was the 12-step work. It would buy me those islands in the day. And I remember this Sunday, not too far after, 
the divorce, and they're living together. And they and I got to go pick up my daughter Sunday morning, and I got to go to where they're all living together as one happy family. And I remember driving up to their place, and I'm sitting in the car outside, and I got this knot in the pit of my stomach, and I, this fear, I don't want to walk up to that door, and I make myself walk up to that door, and I knock on the door, and the happy couple answers the door. <laughs> they, my daughter comes running out, and we go away to spend the day together. And one of the things we did was we went to a ranch that a friend of mine was involved with. And on this ranch, my daughter got to play with some animals, and she got to even ride some of the ponies. And she loved that. She's just a little way to kind of hold her on the pony because she's just a little girl, and she just loved it. We've been there for a while. We're sitting on this picnic bench right next to the corral, and Kate, my daughter, is thirsty, and she wants a soda pop. So there's a soda machine down by the stable. So I, I left her sitting at the picnic bench with the gal who runs that works there in charge of the deal. And I go down to get her a can of pop, and I'm coming back across the yard towards the picnic table, and I hear that my friend, the girl, say to my daughter, "Hey, Kate, here comes your dad." And Kate looks up at me, looks at me, looks at the girl. He says, oh, that's not my daddy. Craig's my daddy. And it felt like somebody stuck a knife in me and just twisted it. And I love my daughter, and I put a smile on my face, and I went over there, and I gave her the soda pop and a hug, and I sat there, and we played the rest of the day. And late that night, I took her home, and we pull up in front of the place, and I grab her by the hand, and I walk her up to the door and knock on the door, and the happy couple opens the door, and she jumps into his arms. I turn around. I go back, and I get in my car. I drive about a block away. I pull over on the side of the road, and I just come apart at the seams. And I'm sitting in the car, and I'm crying, and I'm talking to God, and I'm saying to God, God, I, I can't do this. This is too much. This hurts too much. I love my daughter, but I can't keep doing this. I can't do this. And I look at the clock on the dashboard, and i got to meet this new guy that I just started sponsoring that's a knucklehead down in front of one of the AA clubs. And I was supposed to pick him up there to take him to another meeting. And I don't want to go. I need to go home and really think about this. <laughs> I don't want to go. All right, I, wanna, I need to figure it out. Uh, it's from the chapter into, into figuring. I, I need to figure this out. <clears throat> But I got to meet the guy. And the first spiritual principle I've been taught in Alcoholics Anonymous, and it's paramount. Do what you say you're going to do, Bob. Show up where you say you're going to show up. Be where you're supposed to be when you're supposed to be there. Ah, crap. So I drive over here, and this guy, this idiot's pacing up, front, up and down in front of the A club. I said, get in the car. Gets in the car. <laughs> We're driving and we're taking, going across town to go to this other meeting. He's never been to a big book study. And we're in the car not even a couple minutes. And he starts telling me about what has happened with him and his kids. And he starts crying because he starts crying because he'd been denied by the courts one more time to even see his kids. And it was like a postcard from God. Dear Bob, you can see your daughter. There's only one person interfering with you seeing your daughter, Bob, and that's you. And I thought, ah, all right, I'll go one more week to see her. And one more week, and one more week. And I've never missed. They're no longer a couple. I'm her father. She's in my life. We just came back from a trip to Sweden together. She is the most amazing teenage woman I've ever met. She, I don't, sometimes, my parents, I didn't have alcoholic parents. In my, in my family, it skips generations, right? I am sure there were times that my parents thought because I was in so much trouble and I was so awful when I was a teenager, they must have surely thought that aliens had switched me in the hospital. <laughs> and sometimes because my daughter is such a clear and free spirit and such a good person, intuitively, I often think, could she be my daughter? <laughs> She was giving me relationship advice last week, and I, and I was as I'm listening to it, I'm thinking, God, even my sponsor doesn't know that. <laughs> right. <laughs> it's amazing. And if you if you want to get that kind of stuff, you got to show up where God can can work through people. I mean, you can't. 
if you, there's an old adage in Alcoholics Anonymous, you want to be goosed by the spirit, you've got to get up off your butt. And it is in action helping others when God seems to maximize his effect in my life and his presence. Um, I want to tell you one story and read one thing and then we'll be done, I guess. About 18 years ago, I guess, I was doing an event, an AA event up in Northern California on near the coast on the Oregon border. And I had some time to kill, and this guy stuck me in his pickup truck, and he says, I want to sh- we'll go see some stuff. And he took me to this forest where they had these trees that were 25 feet, 30 feet in diameter, 250 feet high. Amazing. It, this place had a presence, like it was a, some sort of entity, the forest. And I walked around there for a while. I was like being in, going back into time in some primordial forest. It was amazing. And after a while, he says, come on, get in the truck. We're going to go look at these rocks down at the ocean, the, these monoliths that come out of the ocean. So we're driving for a while. And we're going by these fields and meadows. And he, he says to me, you see how you don't see a 250-foot tree all by itself in a field? I said, yeah. He says, you know why that is? I said, no. Why is it? He says, well, God is in his created these trees in such a plan that it is their nature to aspire to grow to such magnificent heights that what happens is alone they will literally grow so big that they outgrow their roots capacity to support themselves and they will literally fall over and die he said what must happen is that they must grow up in community and they intertwine their roots to a net below the floor of the forest and they literally will feed and hold each other up and that allows them to grow into their nature. And I thought at that time as I think today and have thought many times over the years is that is exactly what Alcoholics Anonymous has done. I've had one deep-seated defect of character that is with me still it has always been with me it almost destroyed me prior to you and what that was is that there's always been a yearning inside of me to take bigger bites out of life i've always wanted to feel more experience more i've wanted to be more father ed dowling calls it a divine dissatisfaction and alone, it almost destroyed me. And I came to you and I got a sponsor. I got commitments in the fellowship. I started working the steps. I started helping others and sponsoring people. And unbeknownst to me, I literally intertwined the very roots of my life with yours. And you've allowed me to grow into my nature. And I have a tremendous life today. And I want you to know something. It is not my fault. Of myself, I am nothing. The Father did the work. I'm telling you, the Father did the work. My job has really been just to kind of keep trying to push me out of the center continually and help God's kids. I, I'm going to read something um, to, to end with. and I don't like people who read poems in AA. It's, I think it's tacky. I'm going to risk being one of those guys. To read a poem by a guy who was one of Bill Wilson's spiritual advisors. He was a member in a pretty high up in the Oxford group in New York City. His name was Sam. Sam Shoemaker. Sam was one of the few members of the Oxford group that liked us. You know, some of them didn't. Buckman, the head of the Oxford group, was always having problems with Wilson because he always wanted Wilson to get down to Wall Street and try to minister to the big shots to bring them into the Oxford group to swell his coffers. Buckman equated richness and abundance and to spiritual somehow. I don't know. And Bill didn't want to do it. Bill wanted to go down to the Calvary Mission and Towns Hospital and work with the dregs of the earth. And I think Sam watched him and the early members of AA, and I think he, I don't know, but I think he wrote this poem about us because it is about us. It is the essence of Alcoholics Anonymous. It's called I Stand by the Door. I Stand by the Door. I neither go too far in nor stay too far out. The door is the most important door in the world. It is the door through which men walk when they find God. There is no use my going way inside and staying there when so many are still outside and they, as much as I, crave to know where the door is. And all that so many ever find is only the wall where a door ought to be. They creep along the wall like blind men with outstretched, groping hands, feeling for a door, knowing there must be a door, so I stand by the door. 
the most tremendous thing in the world is for men to find that door, that door to God. The most important thing any man could ever do is to take hold of one of those blind, groping hands and put it on the latch, the latch that opens and clicks.